Um, we have two more minutes, but let us take some time, take some moments to quieten our hearts and prepare ourselves for worship. Hey, hi, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome back to Youth Worship Service. So, as you guys didn't know, actually today is the Youth Worship Service anniversary, right? But, uh, okay, we're not doing anything special. Um, <laughs> so, we'll still be just uh, singing praises to Him. Um, yeah, so the call to worship this morning is actually taken from Psalm 136, verses 1 to 3. Um, can we all read these verses together? Psalm 136, verse 1. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. O oh, give thanks unto the God of gods, for his mercy endureth forever. O oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endureth forever. Let us all rise um, as we go into praise and worship. Let us begin with singing the Ancient of Days. Yeah. 
let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father Lord in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this morning where we are gathered in your house to worship you. We thank you for this freedom to worship and we thank you for this peace uh, in our country. Lord, we praise you for being the almighty God, the Prince of Peace. And Lord, as we sing praises to your name this morning and we study your word through our speaker today, Mr. Renfred Lowe, Lord, may you give him the clarity and discernment to deliver your word with conviction, with clarity, and in truth. Lord, may you shut out all distractions and let us focus fully on you this morning. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, let's remain standing as we uh, continue to sing. Oh, how good it is. Oh, how good it is that we are God's chosen people, saved by His grace. Oh, how good it is that we can freely worship Him in spirit and in truth. So let us sing this song. is always a reminder of God's promises and the glorious feeling when we reunite with Him in heaven. And I think uh, this hymn is also a reminder that sometimes we get too caught up with the pace of this world, with societal pressures, that we lose sight of God um, and we forget that He is there for us always. So um, may this hymn serve as a, a reminder for, for all of us as well this morning. Uh, let us sing Blessed Assurance.
for our last song before we um, go into the message, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. So uh, the cross was actually an instrument that represented death, suffering and shame. But in this hymn, we refer to it as wondrous because it means something different to us when Jesus died um, and paid for our sins on the cross. So uh, let us reflect um, on uh, that occasion. Uh, let us also reflect on um, you know, where we are today and, and uh, what we mean to God. Please be seated. Sorry about that last uh, stanza. Uh, let us read from Titus 2, verses 1 to 6. Uh, it's a short passage, so um, let us read together. Okay, ready? Titus 2, verse 1. But speak thou the things that which become so discharged. Doctrine that the aged man be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in peace. That they be in behavior as become of holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men, likewise, exhort to be sober-minded. May the Lord bless the reading of this holy word. Um, let's now uh, enter into a time of offering. Um, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we, we thank you for um, all the things that you have blessed us with. We thank you for your provision each and every day. We thank you that we have a roof over our heads um, and we have... Uh, food on the table uh, each and every day. Lord, we 
um, we know that all things come from you um, and as we give a portion of what you have blessed us with, uh, may you bless the, the leaders of this church that they may use this money wisely for the furtherance of your kingdom. Lord, we thank you and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so there is this QR code here. Um, if you uh, please put in the reference YWS uh, if you wish to give to church, to, to, to the youth worship service. Um, if you want to give to the church development fund, then indicate church development fund. Yeah. Now invite Mr. Ramford to deliver the message this morning. Thank you. Uh, I've uh, the opportunity, the privilege to uh, speak with you guys again. Uh, and today uh, our session is on uh, cultivating self-control in our lives. Before we start that, let me uh, open us with a short word of prayer to commit the session to the Lord. Uh, dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to praise you in spirit and in truth. And we pray that even as we uh, worship you, even as we uh, listen, uh, you open our hearts, Lord. You ready our hearts to receive from you, uh, from your word this morning. So we commit uh, the time into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah. Uh, bring you all a uh, uh, warm uh, welcome, so warm uh, greetings from uh, Hebron BP Church. Uh, we are currently going, I heard you all have a relocation or you have a, a rebuilding, is it a, a fund that is going on? Yeah, we are also in the midst of relocation, so we have moved out and we are currently using another church premise during this time. Yeah, we're also going through a, a period of uh, uh, renovation and uh, adjusting. So we'll keep you all in prayer as you all uh, raise funds for this uh, phase as well. Today I've come to uh, share with you all about uh, the lack of self-control. Uh, I believe you are on this series of uh, respectable sins and today we have this uh, topic of self-control. Now, uh, interestingly, oh sorry, haven't turned on the clicker. Okay. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, uh, we see uh, self-control being mentioned several times, especially in the uh, New Testament. In the Old Testament, we see uh, the lack of self-control resulting in uh, how it affects uh, or how it causes godly men to fall. Men like Noah who got drunk or David who fell into adultery or uh, uh, King Solomon with many wives. But in the New Testament, we see this word uh, being used uh, as, in the KJV as temperance. So in Galatians, we see this as one of the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance against such there is no law. Even though this is the last in the order here, I can assure you uh, self-control is equally important as any of the other fruits of the Spirit. Now, temperance by definition is moderation in action, thought or feeling. So it's not a total ignoring of how we feel or how we think or what we do. Okay, it's not doing none of it, but doing it in moderation. The same uh, is uh, further defined as the ability to control uh, oneself in particularly one's and emotions and desires, especially in difficult situations. So I think that gives us a pretty good handle on what self-control uh, looks like. So today we'll be looking at 
as Christians, how do we uh, practice or how do we think and how do we react to the ability to exercise restraints over our emotions, our impulses, our desires, and why is that important? So, these are common areas that are mentioned or recognized as affecting uh, us when we lack self-control. Oh, I'm sorry that the, the words on the right are a bit small, but I think most of you all should be able to uh, make it out. So, uh, self-control is quite uh, holistic. It affects many areas of our lives. So physically, it could be uh, as simple as going to a buffet and overeating, our f Singaporean favorite pastime. Or uh, more seriously, it could be sexual immorality or addictions uh, to pornography or online uh, media that uh, we have we realized has run out of our hands and we have no control of. Emotionally, this can be displayed in uh, flashes of anger. It can be displayed in uh, regular impatience in Singapore. I'm not sure how many of yours have uh, started driving, uh, but uh, driving is an area, or I don't know whether any of your parents drive that way, but driving is an area that seems to test a lot of our patience, our ability to control our emotions as well, especially here in Singapore with some drivers uh, not, very, dr not driving very well. And mentally, Okay? It means that we cannot control our own thoughts. We are very prone to move and to wonder. Uh, we cannot control when we feel like, hey, we are going to put a timing on our gaming or our timing on our leisure time, on our YouTube or our Netflix, and we realize, oh no, we have no control over that. Uh, in fact, uh, recent studies have shown that the younger generations growing up, especially those with the devices on their hands, they seem to uh, lack an increasing amount of control over their ability to uh, manage their emotions or their time in relation to their devices. Yeah, um, so I'm going to give you all uh, just uh, two minutes. So we've talked about how it affects your life. Right? I'm just going to give us two minutes to just turn to the person next to you on your left or on your right or in the front if you are uh, all alone, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, or front or back. Okay. How does a lack of self-control affect our relationship with God and others? So these are some examples of how it affects our lives. Uh, how does this affect uh, our relationship with God and others. So just take two minutes, turn to a person on your left and right, pair up, okay, and then uh, share this, and then I will come and I will continue uh, with my sharing. Okay, it's just two minutes, a person left and right. Yeah, it's two minutes, not very long, so y'all can start now. So how does this uh, lack of self-control affect your relationship with God and others? Okay. I see some uh, sheepish uh, smiles as you all uh, share maybe some of your own uh, experiences with lacking or uh, self-control that has affected your relationship with others or with God. Okay? Uh, let's uh, draw the discussions to a close uh, and then uh, let's uh, talk a bit about it. So the reality is that 
uh, some of you might have realized okay, when we lack self-control, we lose control. We react in ways that uh, we don't want to. We react in ways that are not ideal. Like we might want to, but we realize, yeah, it's not very suitable for the situation because we have no control over it, no control over our actions. So we might want to be punctual to meet our friends, but our lack of self-control might cause us to become very, very late. I had a friend who was habitually one hour late for any appointment I made with him. So uh, after the first uh, four meetings, I would always check before I leave my house. Uh, have you left yet? Uh, then after the fifth and sixth, because he'll say, yes, yes, leaving already, leaving already. Then I, I started to uh, realize that yeah, it was an issue we talked about and then we tried to manage as friends. But it would have affected our relationship if he didn't. Hey, ultimately, if we continue uncontrollably pursuing this uh, feelings, these emotions, these uh, pleasurable thoughts or experiences, uh, this hinders our spiritual growth because the thing that we put before God, the thing that we put before others is our own pleasure, is our own comfort. And that leads to a stagnation of spiritual things and, leads, and can lead to an eventual separation from God. Because we start to prioritize self, how we feel, how, what we want, and we increasingly feed into that kind of desires. So when we lack control, we lose control. But what happens is we begin to see who is really in control of our lives. So when we lack self-control in our lives, we lose control of our lives and we begin to see who or what is in control of our lives. Okay, so if, uh, I, no spoilers, but if, uh, I, can I just have a show of hands, how many of you have watched Inside Out 2? Yeah, I, I found it was a pretty good movie. I'll recommend anyone who hasn't uh, watched it to watch it, especially if you're a few years after uh, uh, secondary school. I think you'll appreciate it a bit more. You think back, hey, yes, maybe as a teenager, I used to do some of that things. Yeah, uh, and uh, we are looking at, I'm looking after teenagers now. Uh, yeah, I'm talking to parents who look after teenagers, and I feel like, hey, I know some of the things are quite relatable. And uh, in Inside Out 2, um, there's this idea. So I hope, I think most of you all should have watched Inside Out 1. Uh, it was a movie for uh, yeah, uh, uh, quite a while back. But uh, uh, Inside Out 2 introduces this idea that as memories are made, as experiences have been uh, gone through, uh, eventually all these experiences, all these memories form something uh, in the main character the, or the, the host character, Riley, called a sense of self. Okay, so that's that. Uh, is this the laser? Okay, never mind. That's the, uh, the, the, the blue thing there. And this is uh, it, it's what they call the sense of self. So uh, she doesn't just need her emotions to guide her. Because of all her experiences, all her memories, uh, that starts to guide her. But uh, as both in and out, uh, inside out one and two show, what if only one or what if a negative uh, self is in control? So what if your primary experiences or memories, which some people have, are primarily negative? What if your childhood was marred by uh, uh, abuse, uh, mean words, uh, heartbreak, sadness? What if a bad self was in control? Now we know there's a place for sadness, for anxiety, for anger, but what if that emotion or that feeling is the primary one that is in control of the person? As Christians, who or what is supposed to be controlled? So we know that, hey, uh, yes, we don't want all these negative things to be in control. But as Christians, what then is uh, supposed to be controlled? Is it supposed to be that sense of self? Is it supposed to be me uh, and all the experiences, all the brokenness I see in the world that drives the driver's seat of my life? Well, we see how, let's first see how the world deals with this issue. Okay, 
what if a bad self is in control? We see people who really say they can't help themselves. Uh, one of my uh, co-workers, he worked with addicts and he said, you know, to a certain extent, all their experiences are purely negative. So when you, uh, uh, all their pleasure comes from uh, their addictions and then uh, that is the primary force in which they make decisions in their lives. Whether gambling, whether drugs, whether alcohol. Yeah, so that is the primary uh, determining factor for them to make um, uh, decisions in their life. And there is that uh, Hollywood, uh, Western civilization uh, kind of uh, vibe uh, we watch a lot on uh, social media, we see that in our advertisements, that at some point you should just do what makes you happy. Just do what you want, just do it. So this can easily lead to indulgence. You just see, yeah, you know, food, I'm uh, really unhealthy. The doctor tells me to stop, but I'm going to indulge in it. I'm going to go for the next, my next three meals are going to be buffets. Uh, Self-gratification, we do things that give us a sense of pleasure. But as we continually feed uh, our wants and our needs and our memories and our experiences and our reliance on these things become greater, so does our so our grasp on our self-controls becomes lesser. So there's this uh, cycle of instant uh, gratification. So it shows you or it shows, uh, sometimes I use it to show parents how that if there's an urge, right? Uh, so the kid says, oh, I want to watch uh, Paw Patrol or Peppa Pig or you know, all those kind of shows. And then they move to pleasurable activity, something that gives them a hit of dopamine in the brain. It makes them uh, happy for a short period of time. And they feel rewarded, even though they haven't done uh, something very healthy or, or, or very good, but they feel uh, pleasured and they feel happy. Okay, that, that, that link, uh, that kind of connection to joy. Uh, eventually, uh, every time uh, when you have to deal with a difficult task, so you tell them to go and do math, okay, or go and do uh, a chore that is not so pleasurable, okay, uh, it triggers, okay, a sense of wanting to avoid and wanting something comfortable and then that starts the cycle again. And if at some point you don't break this cycle, then you will just, you will just have a system or a child who uh, just seeks joy or happiness or ease at every point in their life. Now, the other, but thankfully even the world is realizing that yeah, that is not the way we see America as a mess when everybody gets to do what they want. Okay, but and to be fair to the world, there are, I, I think some of you all have friends who are not Christians who look perhaps even more disciplined than yourself. Hey, maybe they hit the gym more regularly, they are more uh, determined to uh, improve their lives and more disciplined. And there's also this track that the world tells you that you can help yourself. You can go through some self-improvement, you can do some self-help, you can read some self-help books, do some self-discipline. And that's how uh, one of my elders who, uh, before he became a Christian, he shared with me, you know, before I became a Christian, I didn't know uh, how to get over my issues. And I ju he, had, he just went through uh, self-help books, he went through therapy, he, he sent himself through therapy, he sent himself through courses, he said. Uh, and in a manner, also, it does help us deal with our uh, habits and issues. So you can uh, technically, with uh, people have shown that yeah, uh, you can work out your issues in that way. But he said, ultimately, when you rely on self, there is no motivation. At some point, when you have hit your goal, you can either make a new goal or say you are happy with that. There is a plateau of that. And sometimes he has to ask himself as well, what is the motivation to becoming better? Why not just put that drive into becoming richer? He was an a, a insur a insurance manager, finance manager. Why don't I just put all this drive into becoming a, 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 a wealthier? And he realized that at some point that was unhealthy. That was not what he was seeking for in life. Matthew 26, 41 says, Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. 
And that's a reminder that, that the fleshly things of the world are very, very easily cause us to uh, fall or move our lives in that dimension rather than to things of God. Now, as Christians, the Bible tells us something very different okay, when it comes to self-control. Uh, in Ephesians 4, 21 to 24, let me read the KJV. Then he put off concerning the former conversions in the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. In the, if, uh, in the ESV, uh, it, uh, they use the words to put off your old self put off your old self and to put on the new self. And we see that this old self, the who we were, who the world, who we are in the world, is a manner of life that is corrupt through deceitful desires, things that we just run after because we feel we want them. At the end of the day, even self-help, self-improvement, self-discipline, uh, if run uh, based on the ways of the world are uh, because you as a self want something better for yourself. It runs on a self-desire. But here in the Bible, what God is saying is to put on this new self and it refers to the new self given to us by God. Okay? And says this, this is a totally new man, new self that is created after the likeness of God in truth in true righteousness and holiness. And he's saying that this new self, it doesn't come from the world. It doesn't come from inside you because the world is sinful, because man by himself is sinful. This new self comes from a God. It's, in the, uh, it, it's designed in the image of God. It's designed as we were in the image of God before the fall. How God intended us to be. And God says, I'm going to, after we believe in Jesus, to put this new self in us so that we can live in a way that pleases and honors Him. So as Christians, we are not supposed to see ourselves even in the driver's seat of our lives. Our sense of self comes secondary and should be conformed to the new self that Jesus has died for, that God has made in His image to put over us. And as Christians, God, this new self in the image of God is what is supposed to be in control. And we have the idea of to put off our old flesh, our old self in the flesh and to put on our new self in Christ. And that is uh, because of what Christ has done on the cross that enables us to do it. So I'm just going to end uh, with three very practical steps, okay, three things that we can, uh, you, you can use or you can think about using as you deal with self-control in your life. The first is a keen awareness and repentance in prayer. Okay? So we need to know, even as we live in this new self, we need to know how this new self is described. How a person who, a self who honors God, who loves God, is described. And that requires, to, uh, that requires us to know the Jesus of the Bible and to know uh, what are God's expectations uh, of us uh, in this new self from His Word. So be aware of areas where you lack control. But at the same time, be aware of how we are supposed to be living by looking at Jesus' life in the Bible and looking at the teachings of the apostles uh, in the uh, Word of God. Okay? We see how, uh, and the, the thing that comes aligned with this is also repentance. Okay, Matthew 4, uh, 1 to 11 shares the temptation of Jesus. We know that as he was tempted in every way, uh, he uh, was found worthy, he did not fail. Okay, and whenever we fail, uh, that's what we need to do. Uh, we don't just give up. We go back to Jesus and say, yeah, we failed uh, and we try again. Okay, so, uh, sorry, this one uh, was wrongly labeled. This is our second point. So, 
Uh, these are some verses. If you have your camera or your phones, or yeah, you maybe want to take a picture of this. This is something you can read uh, at your quiet time at home. Uh, these are verses on self-control to guide us through this uh, session. So, uh, yeah, verses on self-control. Just take a quick picture, uh, put it up for another 15 seconds, then I'll pass the time over. Okay, yeah, I think all of us are done. Okay, the second one is to seek accountability. Okay, so the first one is to know scripture, know to repent when we go wrong in scripture, uh, go wrong according to scripture. But the uh, second one is accountability. And it's really uh, seeking accountability from fellow believers. Okay, so uh, here and there, as we go along this journey, we will fall. But if you have a friend, if you have a mentor, if you have a person in church uh, who you trust to uh, be accountable to you with uh, your issue of self-control. So when you have an uh, issue with self-control, the person can maybe point it out to you or can speak to you in love to encourage you to continue dealing with it. So maybe just take another 10 seconds to uh, just consider, is there someone in church, someone in Galilee who you can uh, say that, yeah, I trust this person, uh, I will approach this person if I struggle with issues of uh, self-control. I can, this is my good friend or my good sister, my good brother who I can uh, share with and who can journey with me in this way. Now, uh, let's, uh, I think, okay, I think some of you are thinking, okay, I think some of you are talking about it, that's good. Uh, yeah, uh, the last one, uh, is the most important. We say that God is the one who puts the new self on us. And the last one is to depend on God, God the Holy Spirit, uh, with whom uh, true self-control is not possible. So if we do it on our strength, to a certain li uh, limit we can show an uh, outward appearance of someone who is very self-controlled. Ultimately, true change towards Christ-likeness is only possible through uh, God's help. And that's through the help of the Holy Spirit. God's grace is essential. Personal effort and discipline are also necessary. You can't just say, I'm going to just rely on God. And then you, uh, every time you have an uh, a, a itch or a desire, you feed into it. That doesn't make sense. At some level, you need to say, yeah, you know what, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask God to help me. Yeah. God, take this urge away. God, help me to be less angry. God, help me to be more patient. Yeah. So, uh, when we fall, okay, uh, that's the uh, importance of taking small steps, but when we fall, uh, we need to uh, repent. Okay? We repent towards God the Father who created us in His image but we are unable to match up, so we say, sorry, God. But at the same time, we remember that Christ on the cross has paid for all our sins. So we repent and knowing that we are forgiven, we are children of God. And we remember Christ on the cross and remember Christ's life. Okay? And Christ's life is something we can emulate. We can see how he reacts in different situations. Like I said, uh, yeah, even uh, Jesus has shown signs of uh, frustration or anger. He flipped tables, but he does that in his way. I don't recommend you flipping tables, but uh, at the same way, remember how he shows uh, much grace and patience okay, in uh, many aspects of his life. And the last one, we speak of relying on the Holy Spirit. So whenever we fail, we just go back and say, Dear Lord, please help me. Holy Spirit, please help me to uh, live according to what uh, God the Father has intended for us to do. Okay, that comes to the end of the session. Uh, I have some discussion questions for later if you have a uh, 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 time of discussion. If not, that's something for you all to uh, reflect. And uh, let me uh, pass the time now back to uh, yeah, the host of the service. Thank you, Mr. Renfred, for um, delivering the message this morning. 
Um, and in response to the message, let us sing uh, the closing song for this morning, I Know Who Holds Tomorrow. Let us all arise. Mr. Ramford to close us with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, you created us uh, in the Garden of Eden in your image to live uh, in relation with you. But as sin came into the world and into our lives, we move further away from that image. But in your grace, you sent Jesus Christ to live perfectly and to die on the cross for our sins so that we can be restored in you, so that we can put on our new selves again, once again, in your image, in your presence and leave behind our old selves. So guide us, help us, Lord, in the way that only you can to live in a way that honours and glorifies your name. In this world and in the next, hold us and give us the joy of your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Okay, um, we've come to the end of the service. I just have some announcements. Uh, so the next youth worship service is on 18th of August. Uh, the speaker is Mr. Lo Jun Yu. Okay, and... Okay, yeah, so um, we have a community day that's coming up. Uh, this will be held on the 9th of August, National Day, uh, in the morning. 
and this will be at the Ayur Raja CC, so just opposite uh, church, right? So um, if you haven't signed up, please sign up. Uh, the link should be sent to you on your broadcast channel, like to your WhatsApp and your Telegram. Um, if you cannot scan the QR code here, if not later, uh, you can just come out and scan also. Uh, yes, so uh, please come and join us um, for this National Day. And um, yeah, if you like to help, uh, yeah, if you are not already serving in any way and you, are, you like to offer your help, um, please approach either me or Caitlin or Phoebe. Yes, okay. Um, that's all. Uh, God bless.